Part 3, Chapter 15 of The Marriage of William Ash by Mary Augusta Ward. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Part 3, Chapter 15 The church clock of Hackett Village had just struck half-past six. A white, sunny mist enwrapped the park and garden. Voices and shouts rang through the mist. Little could yet be seen, but the lawns and the park seemed to be pervaded with bustle and preparation, and every now and then, as the mist drifted, groups of workmen could be distinguished, marquees emerged, flags floated, and carts laden with benches and trestle tables rumbled slowly over the roads and tracks of the park. The house itself was full of gardeners, arranging banks of magnificent flowers in the hall and drawing rooms, and superintended by the head gardener, a person of much greater dignity than Ash himself, who swore at any underling making a noise, as though the slumbers of the quality in the big house overhead and the danger of disturbing them were the dearest interests of a burdened life. As to the mistress of the house, at any rate, there was no need for caution. The clocks of the house had barely followed the church clock in striking the half-hour, when the workman on the ground floor saw Lady Kitty come downstairs and go through the drawing-room window into the garden. There she gave her opinion on the preparations, pushing on afterwards into the park, where she astounded the various contractors and their workmen by her appearance at such an hour, and by the vigour and decision of her orders. Finally, she left the park behind, just as its broad, scorched surfaces began everywhere to shake off the mist, and entered one of the bordering woods. She had a basket on her arm, and when she had found for herself a mossy seat amid the roots of a great oak, she unpacked it. It contained a mass of written pages, some fresh scribbling paper, ink and pens, and a small portfolio. When they were all lying on the moss beside her, Kitty turned over the sheets with a loving hand, reading here and there. It is good, she said to herself. I vow it is. Dipping her pen in the ink, she began upon corrections. The sun filtered through the thick leafage overhead, touching her white dress, her small shoes, and the masses of her hair. She wore a leghorn garden hat, tied with pink ribbons under her chin, and in her morning freshness and daintiness she looked about seventeen. The hours of sleep had calmed the restlessness of the wide brown eyes. They were full now of gentleness and mirth. "'I wonder if he'll come?' She looked up and listened, and as she did so, her eyes and sense were seized with the beauty of the wood. The mystery of early solitary hours seemed to be still upon it. Both in the sunlight and the shadow there was a magic unknown to the later day. In a clearing before her spread a lake of willow herb of a pure bright pink, hemmed in by a golden shore of ragwort. The splash of colour gave Kitty a passionate delight. Dear, dear world, she stretched out her hands to it in a childish greeting. Then the joy died sharply from her eyes. How many years left to enjoy it in, before one dies, or one's heart dies? Invariably now her moments of sensuous pleasure ended in this dread of something beyond, of a sudden drowning of beauty and delight, of a future unknown and cruel, coming to meet her, like some armed assassin in a narrow path. William. When it came, could William save her? William is a darling, she said to herself, her face full of yearning. As for that other, it gave her an intense pleasure to think of the flames creeping up the form and face of the photograph. Should she hear perhaps in a week or two that he'd been seized with some mysterious illness, like the witch victims of old? A shiver ran through her, a thrill of repentance, till the bitter lines of the poem came back to memory, lines describing a woman with neither the courage for sin nor the strength for virtue. A light woman, indeed whom the great passions passed eternally by, whom it was a humiliation to, to court and a mere weakness to regret. Then she laughed and began again with passionate zest upon the sheets before her. A sound of approaching footsteps on the wood path. She half rose, smiling. The branches parted and Darrell appeared. He paused to survey the oread vision of Lady Kitty. Am I not to the minute? He heard off his watch in front of her. So you got my note? Certainly I was immensely flattered. He threw himself down on the moss beside her, 
his sallow, long chinned face and dark eyes toned to a morning cheerfulness, his dress much fresher and more exact than usual. But he is one of the men who look so much better in their old clothes, thought Kitty. Well, what can I do for you, Lady Kitty? he resumed, smiling. I wanted your advice, said Kitty, not altogether sure, now that he was there beside her, that she did want it. About your literary work? She threw him a quick glance. Do you know? How do you know? I've been writing a book. So I imagined. And, and... She broke now into eagerness, bending forward. I want you to help me get it published. It is a deadly secret. Nobody knows. Not even William? No one, she repeated, and I can't tell you about it or show you a line of it unless you vow and swear to me. Oh, I swear, said Darrell tranquilly. I swear. Kitty looked at him doubtfully a moment, then resumed. I have written it at all sorts of times, when William was away, in the middle of the night, out in the woods. Nobody knows. You see, her little fingers plucked at the moss, I have a good many advantages. If people want society with a big S, I can give it them. Naturally, said Darrell. And it always amuses people, doesn't it? Kitty clasped her hands round her knees and looked at him with candour. Does it? said Darrell. It's been done a good deal. Oh, of course, said Kitty impatiently. Mine's not the proper thing. You don't imagine I should try and write like Thackeray to you. Mine's real people, real things that happened, with just the names altered. Ah, said Darrell, sitting up. That sounds exciting. Is it libelous? Well, that's just what I want to know, said Kitty slowly. Of course, I've made a kind of story out of it, but you'd have to be a great fool not to guess. I put myself in and... And Ash? Kitty nodded. All the novels that are written about politics nowadays, except Dizzy's, are such nonsense, aren't they? I just wanted to describe from the inside how a real statesman, she threw up her head proudly, lives and what he does. Excellent subject, said Darrell. Well, anybody else? Kitty flushed. You, you'll see, she said uncertainly. Darrell's involuntary smile was hidden by a bunch of honeysuckle at which he was sniffing. "'May I look?' he asked, stretching out a hand for the sheets. She pushed them towards him, half unwilling, half eager, and he began to turn them over. Apparently it had a thread of story, both slender and extravagant, and on the thread, hello, here was the fancy ball. He pounced upon it. "'A portrait of Lady Parham. Ye powers!' he chuckled as he read. On the next page, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, snub-nosed parvenu and puritan, admirably caught. Further on, a speech of ashes in the house, with caricature to right and caricature to left. Ah, the poet at last! He bent over the page till Kitty coughed and fidgeted, and he thought it best to hurry on. But it was war, he perceived, open, undignified, feminine war. On the next page, the Archbishop of Canterbury, with Lady Kitty's views on the Athanasian Creed. Heavens, what a book! Next, royalty itself, not too respectfully handled. Then Ash again. Ash glorified, Ash explained, Ash intrigued against her, and Ash a triumphant. Everywhere, the centre of the stage, and everywhere, of course, all unknown to the author, the fool of the piece. Political indiscretions also, of the most startling kind, as coming from the wife of a cabinet minister. Allusions, besides, scattered broadcast to the scandals of the day, material, as far as he could say, for a dozen libel actions. And with it all, much fantastic ability, flashes of wit and romance, enough to give the book wings beyond its first personal audience. Enough, in fact, to secure in all its scandalous matter the widest possible chance of fame. Well... He rolled over on his elbows and lay staring at the sheets before him, dumb. What was he to say? A thought struck him. As far as he could perceive, there was an empty niche. And Lord Parham? A smile of mischief broadened on Kitty's lips. That'll come, she said, and checked herself. Darrell bowed his face on his hands and laughed, unseen. To what sacrificial rite was the unconscious victim hurrying at? at that very moment, in the express train which was to land him at Haggard Station that afternoon. Well, said Kitty impatiently, what do you think? Can you help me? Darrow looked up. 
You know, Lady Kitty, that book can't be published like that. Nobody would risk it. Well, I suppose they'd tell me what to cut out. Yes, said Darrell slowly, caught by many reflections. No doubt some clever fellow will know how near the wind it's possible to sail. But anyway, trim it as you like. The book will make a scandal. Will it? Kitty's eyes flashed. She sat up radiant, her breath quick and defiant. I don't see, he resumed, how you can publish it without consulting Ash. Kitty gave a cry of protest. No, 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 of course he'd disapprove, but then he soon forgives a thing if he thinks it's clever. And it is clever, isn't it? Some of it. He'd laugh, and then it would be all right. He'd never pay out his enemies, but he couldn't help enjoying it if someone else did. Could he? She pleaded like a child. No need to forgive them, murmured Darrell, as he rolled over on his back and put his hat over his eyes. Or you would have shot them all. Under the shelter of his hat, he tried to think himself clear. What really were her motives? Partly, no doubt, a childish love of excitement. Partly revenge. The animus against the palms was clear in every page. Cliff, too, came badly out of it. A fantastic, Byronic mixture of libertine and cad. Lady Kitty had better beware. As far as he knew, Cliff had never yet been struck with impunity to the striker. If these precious sheets ever appeared, Ash's position would certainly be shaken. Poor wretch, endeavouring to pursue a serious existence, yoked to such an impish sprite as this. His own fault, after all. That first night of Madame Destre's, was not her madness written in her eyes? Now, tell me, Lady Kitty, he roused himself to look at her with some attention, what do you want me to do? To find me a publisher, and... She stooped towards him with a laughing shyness. To get me some money. Money? I've been so awfully extravagant lately, said Kitty frankly. Something really will have to be done. And the book's worth some money, isn't it? A good deal, said Darrell. Then he added with emphasis, I really can't be responsible for it in any way, Lady Kitty. Of course not. I will never, never say I told you. But, you see, I'm not literary. I don't know in the least how to set about it. If you would just put me in communication? Darrell pondered. None of the well-known publishers, of course, would look at it. But there were plenty of people who would, and give Lady Kitty a large sum of money for it, too. What part, however, could he, Darrell, play in such a transaction? I am bound to warn you, he said at last, looking up, that your husband will probably strongly disapprove of this book and that it may do him harm. Kitty bit her lip. But if I tell nobody who wrote it, and you tell nobody? Ash would know at once. Everybody would know. William would know, his companion admitted unwillingly. But I don't see why but anybody else should. You see, I've put myself in. I've said the most shocking things. Darrell replied that she would not find that device of much service to her. However, I could no doubt get an opinion for you. Kitty, all delight, thanked him profusely. You shall have the whole of it before you go. Friday, isn't it? She said, eagerly gathering it up. Darrell was certainly conscious of no desire to burden himself with the horrid thing. But he was rarely able to refuse the request of a pretty and fashionable woman, and it flattered his conceit to be the sole recipient of what might very well turn out to be a political secret of some importance. Not that he meant to lay himself open to any just reproach whatever in the matter. He would show it to some fitting person to pacify Lady Kitty, write a letter of strong protest to her afterwards, and wash his hands of it. What might happen then was not his business. Meanwhile, his inner mind was full of an acrid debate which turned entirely upon his interview with Ash of the day before. No doubt as an old friend, aware of Lady Kitty's excitable character, he might have felt it his duty to go straight to Ash, hoot kakoot, and warn him of what was going on. But what encouragement had been given him to play so quixotic a part? Why should he take any particular thought for Ash's domestic peace, or Ash's public place? What consideration had Ash shown for him? Du la voulu, jure So, it ended in his promising to take the manuscript to London with him, 
and let Lady Kitty know the result of his inquiries. Kitty's dancing step as they returned to the house betrayed the height of her spirits. A rumour flew round the house towards the middle of the day that Harry, the little heir, was worse. Kitty did not appear at luncheon, and the doctor was sent for. Before he came, it was known only to Margaret French that Kitty had escaped by herself from the house and could not be found. Ash and Lady Tramwell saw the doctor, who prescribed, and would not admit that there was any cause for alarm. The heat had tried the child, and Lady Kitty, he looked round the nursery for her in some perplexity, might be quite reassured. Margaret found her wandering in the park, very wild and pale, told her the doctor's verdict, and brought her home. Kitty said little or nothing, and was presently persuaded to change her dress for Lord Parham's arrival. By the time the operation was over, she was full, as usual, of smiles and chatter, with no trace, apparently, of the mood which had gone before. Lord Parham found the house party assembled on the lawn, with Kitty in a three-cornered hat, fantastically garnished at the side with a great plume of white cock's feathers, presiding at the tea-table. Ah, thought the Premier as he approached, now for the tear in Ash's wheat. Nothing, however, could have been more gracious than Kitty's reception of him, or more effusive than his response. He took his seat beside her, a solid and impressive figure, no less closely observed by such of the habitual guests of the political country houses as happened to be present, than by the sprinkling of local clergy and country neighbours to whom Kitty was giving tea. Lord Parham, though now in the fourth year of his premiership, was still something of a mystery to his countrymen, while for the inner circle it was an amusement and an event that he should be seen without his wife. For some time all went well. Kitty's manners and topics were alike beyond reproach. When presently she inquired politely as to the success of his Scottish tour, Lord Parham hoped he had not altogether disgraced himself. But, thank heaven, it was done. Meanwhile, Ash, he supposed, had been enjoying the pursuits of a scholar and a gentleman. Lucky fellow. He's been reading the Bible, said Kitty carelessly, as she handed cake. Just now he's in the axe. That's why I suppose he didn't hear the carriage. John, she called a footman, tell Mr. Ash that Lord Parham has arrived. The Premier opened astonished eyes. Does Ash generally study the scriptures of an afternoon? Kitty nodded, with her most confiding smile. When he can, he says, she dropped her voice to a theatrical whisper, the Bible is such a damned interesting book. Lord Parham started in his seat. Ash and some of his friends still faintly recalled of their too familiar and public use of this particular naughty word, the lurid vocabulary of the Peel and Melville generation. But in a lady's mouth the effect was prodigious. Lord Graceville frowned sternly and walked away. Lady Helston smothered a burst of laughter. The dean, startled, broke off a conversation with a group of archaeological clergymen and came to see what he could do to keep Lady Kitty in order. While Lady Tramwell flushed deeply and began a hasty conversation with Lady Edith Manley. Meanwhile, Kitty, quite unconscious, went on cutting, or rather dispensing, bread and butter and Lord Parham changed the subject. "'What a charming house!' he said unwarily, waving his hand towards the haggard mansion. He was short-sighted, and in truth saw only that it was big. Kitty looked at him in wonder, a friendly and amiable wonder. She said it was very kind of him to try and spare her feelings, but really anybody might say what they liked of Haggard. She and William weren't responsible. Lord Parham rather nettled, put on his eyeglass, and, being an obstinate man, still maintained that he saw no reason at all to be dissatisfied with Haggard from the aesthetic point of view. Kitty said nothing, but for the first time a gleam of mockery showed itself in her changing look. Lady Tramwell, already nervous on the watch, moved forward at this point, and Lord Parham, with marked and pompous suavity, transferred his conversation to her. Thus assured, as he thought, of a good listener and delivered from his uncomfortable hostess, Lord Parham crossed his legs and began to talk at his ease. The guests round the various tea-tables converged, 
some standing and some sitting, and made a circle about the great man. About Kitty, too, who sat equally conspicuous, dipping a biscuit in milk and teasing her small dog with it. Paul Parham, meanwhile, described to Lady Tramwell, at a wearisome length, the demonstrations which had attended his journey south, the railway station crowds, addresses, and so forth. He handled the topic in a tone of jocular humility, which but slightly concealed the vast complacency beneath. Kitty's lip twitched. She fed Ponto hastily with all possible cakes. No one, of course, can keep any count of what he says on these occasions, resumed Lord Parham with a gracious smile. I hope I talked some sense. Oh, but why? said Kitty, looking up, her large fawn's eyes bent on the speaker. Why? repeated Lord Parham, suddenly stiffening. I don't follow you, Lady Kitty. Anybody can talk sense, said Kitty, throwing a big bit of muffin at Ponto's nose. It's the other thing that's hard, isn't it? Lady Kitty, said the Dean, lifting a finger, you are plagiarising from Mr Pitt. Am I? said Kitty. I didn't know. I imagine that Mr Pitt talked sense sometimes, said Lord Parham shortly. Ah, that was when he was drunk, said Kitty. Then he wasn't responsible. Lord Parham and the circle laughed, though the Premier's laugh was a little dry and perfunctory. So you worship nonsense, Lady Kitty? Kitty nodded sweetly. And so does William. Ah, here he is. For Ash appeared hurrying over the lawn, and Lord Parham rose to greet his host. Upon my word, Ash, how well you look. You have had some holiday. Which is more than can be said of yourself, said Ash, with smiling sympathy. Well, how have the speeches gone? Is there anything left of you? Edinburgh was magnificent. He wore his most radiant aspect as he sat down beside his guest, and Kitty watched him, and already conscious of a renewed and excitable dislike for her guest, thought William was overdoing it absurdly, and grew still more restless. The Premier brought the tips of his fingers lightly together as he resumed his seat. Oh, my dear fellow, people were very kind. Too much so. Yes, I think it did good. It did good. I should now rest and be thankful, if it weren't for the bishops. The bishops, said the rector of the parish, standing near. What have the bishops been doing, my lord? Dying, said Kitty, as she fell into an attitude which commanded both William and Lord Parham. They do it on purpose. Another this morning, said Ash, throwing up his hands. Oh, they die to plague me, said the Prime Minister with the air of one on whom the universe weighs heavily. There never was such a conspiracy. You should let William appoint them, said Kitty, leaning her chin upon her hands and studying Lord Parham, with eyes all the more brilliant for the dark circles which fatigue or something else had drawn round them. Ah, to be sure, said Lord Parham, affably. I had forgotten that Ash was our theologian. Take me a walk before dinner, he added, addressing his host. But you won't take his advice, said Kitty, smiling. Premier turned rather sharply. How do you know that, Lady Kitty? Kitty hesitated, then said with the prettiest, slightest laugh, Lady Parham has such strong views, hasn't she, on, on church questions? Lord Parham's feeling was that a more insidiously impertinent question had never been put to him. He drew himself up. If she has, Lady Kitty, I can only say I know very little about them. She very wisely keeps them to herself. Ah, said Kitty, as her lovely eyebrows lifted, that shows how little people know. I don't quite understand, said Lord Parham. To what do you allude, Lady Kitty? Kitty laughed. She raised her eyes to the rector, a spare high churchman who had retreated uncomfortably behind Lady Tranmore. Someone said to me last week that Lady Parham had saved the church. The Prime Minister rose. I must have a little exercise before dinner. Your gardens, Ash, is there time? Ash, scarlet with discomfort and annoyance, carried his visitor off. As he did so, he passed his wife. Kitty turned her little head, looked at him half shyly, half defiantly. The dean saw the look, saw also that Ash deliberately avoided it. The party presently began to disperse. The dean found himself beside his hostess, strolling over the lawn towards the house. He observed her attentively. 
vexed with her and vexed for her. Surely she was thinner than he'd ever seen her. A little more, and her beauty would suffer seriously. Coming he knew not whence, there lit upon him the sudden and painful impression of something undermined, something consumed from within. Hitty Kitty, do you ever rest? he asked her unexpectedly. Rest? she laughed. Why should I? Because you are wearing yourself out. She shrugged her shoulders. Do you ever lie down alone and read a book? insisted the dean. Yes, I've just finished Renan's Vie de Jesus. At last, even with him, kept its note of audacity, but much softened by a kind of wistfulness. Ah, oh, my dear Kitty, let Renan alone, cried the dean, then with a change of tone. But are you speaking truth or naughtiness? Truth, said Kitty, but of course I am in a temper. The dean laughed. I see Lord Parham is not a favourite of yours. Kitty compressed her small lips. To think that William should have to take his orders from that man, she said under her breath. Bear it, for William's sake, said the dean softly, and me ma'am, take my advice and don't read any more, Renan. Kitty looked at him curiously. I prefer to see things as they are. The dean sighed. That none of us can do, my dear Lady Kitty. No one can satisfy his intelligence. But religion speaks to the will, and it is the only thing between us and the void. Don't tamper with it. It is soon gone. A satirical expression passed over the face of his companion. Mine was gone before we had been a month married. William killed it. The dean exclaimed, I hear always of his interest in religious matters. He cares for nothing so much, and he doesn't believe one single word of anything. I was brought up in a convent, you know, but William laughed it all out of me. Dear Lady Kitty, Kitty nodded. And now, of course, I know there's nothing in it. Oh, I do beg your pardon, she said eagerly. I never meant to say anything rude to you, and I must go. She looked up at an open window on the second floor of the house. The dean supposed it was the nursery, and began to ask after the boy. But before he could frame his question, she was gone, flying over the grass with a foot that scarcely seemed to touch it. Poor child, poor child, murmured the dean in a most genuine distress. But it was not the boy he was thinking of. Presently, however, he was overtaken by Miss French, of whom he inquired how the baby was. Margaret hesitated. He seems to lose strength, she said sadly. The doctor declares there is no danger unless... Unless what? Oh, but it's so unlikely, was her hasty reply. Don't let's think of it. Kitty was just giving a last look at herself in the large mirror which lined half one of the sides of her room when Ash invaded her. She glanced at him askance a little, and when the maid had gone, Kitty hurriedly gathered up gloves and fan and prepared to follow her. Kitty, one word. He caught her in his arm and held her while he looked down upon her sparkling dress and half-reluctant face. Kitty, do be nice to that old fellow tonight. It's only for two nights. Take him in the right way and make a conquest of him, for good. He's been very decent to me in our walk, and you did say such extraordinary things to him this afternoon. I believe he really wants to make amends. I do hate his white eyelashes so, said Kitty slowly. What does it matter, cried Ash angrily, whether he were a blue-faced baboon? For two nights. Just listen to him a little, Kitty, that's all he wants. And don't be offended, but hold your own small tongue just a little. Kitty pulled herself away. I believe I shall do something dreadful, she said quietly. A sternness to which Ash's good-humoured face was almost wholly strange showed itself in his expression. Why should you do anything dreadful, please? Lord Parham is your guest and my political chief. Is there any woman in England who would not do her best to be civil to him under the circumstances? I suppose not, said Kitty with deliberation. No, I don't think there can be. Kitty! For the first time, Ash was conscious of real exasperation. What was to be done with a temperament and a disposition like this? Do you never think that you have it in your power to help me or to ruin me? He said with vehemence. 
Oh, yes, often. I mean, to help you, in my own way. Ash's laugh was a sound of pure annoyance. Ha! But please understand it would be infinitely better if you would help me in my way, in the natural, accepted way, the way that everybody understands. The way Lord Parham recommends? Kitty looked at him quietly. Never mind, William, I am trying to help you. Her eyes shone with the strangest glitter. Ash was conscious of another of those sudden stabs of anxiety about her which he had felt at intervals through the preceding year. His face softened. Dear, don't let's talk nonsense. Just look at me sometimes at dinner and say to yourself, William asked me, for his sake, to be nice to Lord Parham. He again drew her to him, but she repulsed him almost with violence. Why is he here? Why have we people dining? We ought to be alone in the dark. Her face had become a white mask. Her breast rose and fell as though she fought with sobs. Kitty, what do you mean? He recoiled in dismay. Harry, she just breathed the word between her closed lips. My darling, cried Ash, I saw Dr. Rotherham myself this afternoon. He gave the most satisfactory account, and Margaret told me she had repeated everything to you. The child will soon be himself again. He is dying, said Kitty, in the same low, remote voice, her gaze still fixed on Ash. Kitty, don't say such things. Don't think them. Ash had himself grown pale. At any rate, he turned on her reproachfully. Tell me why you think them. Confide in me, Kitty. Come and talk to me about the boy. But three-fourths of the time you behave as though there was nothing the matter with him. You won't even see the doctor. And then you say a thing like this. She was silent a moment. Then, with a wild gesture of the head and shoulders, as of one shaking off a weight, she moved away, drew on her long gloves, and, going to the dressing table, gave a touch of rouge to her cheeks. Kitty, why did you say that? Ash followed her entreatingly. I don't know. At least, I couldn't explain. Now, shall we go down? Ash drew a long breath. His frail son held the inmost depths of his heart. You've made the party an abomination to me, he said with energy. Don't believe me, then. Believe the doctor, said Kitty, her face changing. And as for Lord Parham, I'll try, William. I'll try. She passed him, the loveliest of visions, flung him a hand to kiss, and was gone. End of Part 3, Chapter 15《Part Three, Chapter Sixteen of *The Marriage of William Ash* by Mary Augusta Ward. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Part Three, Chapter Sixteen. There could be no question that, in all external matters, Lord Parham was that evening magnificently entertained by the Home Secretary and Lady Kitty Ash. The chef was extravagantly good. The wines, flowers, and service lavish to a degree which made both Ash and Lady Tramwell secretly uncomfortable. Lady Tramwell in particular detested show, influenced as much by aristocratic instinct as by moral qualms. And there was, to her mind, a touch of vulgarity in the entertaining at Haggart, which might be tolerated in the case of financiers and nouveau riche, while, as connected with her William and his wife, who had no need whatever to bribe society, it was unbecoming and undignified. Moreover, the winter had been marked by a financial crisis caused entirely by Kitty's extravagance. A large sum of money had had to be raised from the Tramwell estates. Times were not good for the landed interest, and the head agent had begun to look grave. If only William would control his wife. But Haggart contained one of those fine, slowly gathered libraries which make the distinction of so many English country houses, and in the intervals of his official work, which even in holiday time was considerable, Ash could not be beguiled from the beloved company of his books to help Kitty sign cheques or scold her about expenditure. So Kitty signed and signed, and the smaller was Ash's balance, the more, it seemed, did Kitty spend. Then, of course, every few months there were deficits which had to be made good. 
and as to the debts which accumulated, Lady Pramworth preferred not to think about them. It all meant future trouble and a clipping of wings for William, and it all entered into that deep and hidden resentment, half anxious love, half alien temperament, which Elizabeth Tramwell felt towards Ash's wife. However, to repeat, Lord Parham, as far as the flesh pots went, was finely treated. Kitty was in full force, glittering in a spangled dress, her dazzling face and neck and the piled masses of her hair thrown out in relief against the panelled walls of the dining room with a brilliance which might have tempted a modern Rembrandt to paint an English Saskia. Lady Helston, on her left, could not take his eyes from her. And even Lord Parham, much as he disliked her, acknowledged during the early courses that she was handsome, and in her own way, thank God it was not the way of any womankind belonging to him, good company. He saw, too, or thought he saw, that she was anxious to make him amends for her behaviour of the afternoon. She restrained herself and talked politics, and within the lines he always observed when talking to women, lines dictated by contempt inane and eradicable, Lord Parham was quite ready to talk politics too. Then it suddenly struck him that she was pumping him, and with great adroitness. Ash, he knew, wanted an early place in the session for a particular measure in which he was interested. Lord Parham had no mind to give him the precedence that he wanted, was in fact determined on something quite different. But he was well aware by now that Ash was a person to be reckoned with, and he had so far taken refuge in vagueness, an amiable vagueness by which Ash, on their walk before dinner, had been much taken in, misled no doubt by the strength of his own wishes. And now here was Lady Kitty, who, by the way, was not at all easy to take in, trying to manage him, to pin him to details, to wheedle him out of a pledge. Lord Parham, presently, looked at her with cold, smiling eyes. Ah, you are interested in these things, Lady Kitty. Well, tell me your views. You women have such an instinct. Whereby the moth was kept hovering round the flame. Till, in a flash, Kitty awoke to the fact that while she had been listening happily to her own voice, taking no notice whatever of the signals which William endeavoured to send her from the other end of the table, while she had been tripping gaily through one indiscretion after another, betraying innumerable things as to William's opinions and William's plans that she'd infinitely better not have betrayed, Lord Parham had said nothing, betrayed nothing, promised nothing. A quiet smile, a courteous nod, and presently a shade of mockery in the lips. The meaning of them all, in a moment, burst on Kitty. Her face flamed. Thenceforward it would be difficult to describe the dinner. Conversationally, at Kitty's end, it became an uproar. She started the wildest topics, and Lord Parham had afterwards a bruised recollection as of one who has been dragged or driven, Caliban-like, through brake and thicket, pinched and teased and pelted by elfish fingers, without one single uncivil speech or act of avert offence to which an angry guest could point. With each later course, the Prime Minister grew stiffer and more silent. Endurance was written in every line of his fighting head and round, ungraceful shoulders, in his veiled eyes and stolid mouth. Lady Trammell gave a gasp of relief when at last Kitty rose from her seat. The evening went no better. Lord Parham was set down to cards with Kitty, Lady Helston and Lord Graceville. Lord Graceville, his partner, played to the Premier's thinking like an idiot, and Lady Kitty and the young man chattered and sparred so that all reasonable play became impossible. Lord Parham lost more than he had at all liked to lose, and at half-past ten he pleaded fatigue, refused to smoke, and went to his room. Ash was perfectly aware of the failure of the evening and the discomfort of his guest, but he said nothing, and Kitty avoided his neighbourhood. Meanwhile, between him and his mother, a certain tacit understanding began to make itself felt. They talked quietly in corners of the arrangements for the speech and fate of the morrow. So far, they had been too much left to Kitty. Ash promised his mother to look into them. He and she combined for the protection of Lord Parham. When, about one o'clock, Ash went to bed, Kitty either was, or pretended to be, fast asleep. The room was in darkness, save for the faint illumination of a nightlight, which just revealed to Ash the delicate figure of his wife, 
lying high on her pillows, her cheek and brow hidden in the confusion of her hair. One window was wide open to the night, and once more Ash stood lost in recollection beside it, as on that night in Hill Street more than a year before. But the thoughts which on that former occasion had been still as tragic and unfamiliar guests in a mind that repelled them, had now, alack, lost their strangers. They entered habitually, unannounced, frequent, irritating, deplorable. Had the relation between himself and Kitty ever, in truth, recovered the shock of that incident on the river, of his night of restlessness, his morning of agonised alarm, and the story to which he listened on her return? It had been like some physical blow or wound, easily healed or conquered for the moment, which then, as time goes on, reveals a hidden series of consequences. Consequences, in this case, connected above all with Kitty's own nature and temperament. The excitement of Cliff's declaration, of her own resistance and dramatic position, as between her husband and her lover, had worked ever since as a poison in Kitty's mind. Ash was becoming dismally certain of it. The absurd incident of the night before, with the photograph, had been enough to prove it. Well, the thing he supposed would write itself in time. Meanwhile, Cliff had been dismissed, and this foolish young fellow, Eddie Helston, must soon follow him. Ash had viewed the affair so far with an amused tolerance. If Kitty liked to flirt with babes, it was her affair, not his. But he perceived that his mother was once more becoming restless under the general inconvoyance of it, and he had noticed distress and disapproval in the little Dean, Kitty's staunchest friend. Luckily, no difficulty there. The lad was almost as devoted to him, Ash, as he was to Kitty. He was absurd, affected, vain. But there was no vice in him, and a word of remonstrance would probably reduce him to abject regret and self-reproach. Ash intended that his mother should speak it, and as he made up his mind to ask her help, he felt for the second time the sharp humiliation of the husband who cannot secure his own domestic peace, but must depend on the aid of others. Yet how could he himself go to young Helston? Some men, no doubt, could have handled such an incident with dignity. Ash with his critical sense for ever playing on himself and others, with a touch of moral shirking that belonged to his inmost nature, and, above all, with his half-humorous, half-bitter consciousness that whoever else might be a hero, he was none. Ash, at least, could and would do nothing of the sort. That he should begin now to play the tyrannous or jealous husband would make him ridiculous, both in his own eyes and other people's. And yet Kitty must somehow be protected from herself. Then, as to politics. Once, in talking with his mother, he had said to her that he was Kitty's husband first, and a public man afterwards. Was he prepared now to make the statement with the same simplicity, the same wholeheartedness? Involuntarily, he moved closer to the bed and looked down on Kitty. Little, delicate face, always with something mournful and fretful in repose. He loved her surely as much as ever. Ah, oh, yes, he loved her. His whole nature yearned over her as the wife of his youth, the mother of his poor boy. Yet, as he remembered the mood in which he had proposed to her, that defiance of the world and life which had possessed him when he had made her marry him, he felt himself, almost with bitterness, another and a meaner man. No, he was not prepared to lose the world for her the world of high influence and ambition upon which he now entered as a conqueror. She must so control herself that she did not ruin all his hopes, which after all were hers, and the work he might do for his country. What incredible perversity and caprice she had shown towards Lord Parham! How was he to deal with it? He, William Ash, with his ironic temper and his easy standards. What could he say to her but, Love me, Kitty. Love yourself and don't be a little fool. Life might be so amusing if you would only bridle your fancies and play the game. As for loftier things, self-reverence, self-knowledge, self-control, duty and the passion of high ideals, who was he to prate about them? The little Dean, perhaps, most spiritual of worldlings. Ash knew himself to be neither spiritual nor a hypocrite. A certain measure, a certain order and harmony in life 
laughter and good humour and affection, and for the fight that makes him well to man those great political and social interests in the midst of which he found himself, he asked no more, and with these he would have been abundantly content. He sighed and frowned, his muscles stiffening unconsciously. Yet for both their sakes he must try and play the master with Kitty, ridiculous as it seemed. He turned away, remembering his sick child, and went noiselessly to the nursery. There, along the darkened passages, he found a night nurse, sitting working beside a shaded lamp. The child was sleeping, and the report was good. Ash stole on tiptoe to look at him, holding his breath, then returned to his dressing room. But a faint call from Kitty pursued him. He opened the door and saw her sitting up in bed. How is he? She was hardly awake, but her expression struck him as very wild and piteous. He went to her and took her in his arms. Sleeping quietly, darling, so must you. She sank back on her pillows, his arms still round her. I was there an hour ago, she murmured. I shall soon wake up. But for the moment she was asleep again, her fair head lying against his shoulder. He sat down beside her, supporting her. Suddenly, as he looked down upon her with mingled passion, tenderness and pain, a sharp perception assailed him. How thin she was, a mere feather's weight. The face was smaller than ever, the hands, skin and a bone. Margaret French had once or twice bade him notice this, had spoken with anxiety. He bent over his wife and observed her attentively. It was merely the effect of a hot summer, surely, and of a constant nervous fatigue. He would take her abroad for a fortnight in September, if his official work would let him, and perhaps leave her in Port Italy or Switzerland with Margaret French. The great day was halfway through, and the throng in Haggard Park and Grounds was at its height. A flower show in the morning, then a tenant's dinner with a speech from Ash, and now, in a marquee erected for the occasion, Lord Parham was addressing his supporters in the county. Around him on the platform sat the Whig gentry, the radical bent manufacturers, the town wire-pullers and local agents on whom a great party depended. In front of him stretched a crowded meeting drawn in almost equal parts from the coal-mining districts to the north of Haggart and from the agricultural districts to the south. The August air was stifling. Perspiration shone on the broad brows and cheeks of the farmers sitting in the front half of the audience. Lord Parham's grey face was almost white, his harsh voice laboured against the acoustic difficulties of the tent. Effort and heat, discomfort and ennui breathed from the pack benches and from the short-necked, large-headed figure of the Premier. Ash sat to the speaker's right, outwardly attentive, inwardly ashamed of his party and his chief. He himself belonged to a new generation, for whom formulae that had satisfied their fathers were empty and dead. But with these formulas, Lord Parham was stuffed. A man of average intriguing ability, he'd been raised, at a moment of transition, to the place he held, by a consummate command of all the meaner arts of compromise and management, no less than by an invaluable power of playing to the gallery. He led a party who despised him, and he complacently imagined that he was the party. His speech on this occasion bristled with himself, and had, in truth, no other substance. The eyes swarmed out upon the audience like wasps. Ash groaned in spirit. We have the ideas, he thought, but they are damn little good to us. It is the Tories who have the men. Ye gods, must we all talk like this at last? Suddenly, on the other side of the platform, behind Lord Parham, he noticed that Kitty and Eddie Helston were exchanging signs. Kitty drew out a tablet, wrote upon it, and leaning over some white-frocked children of the Lord Lieutenant who sat behind her, handed the torn leaf to Helson. But from some clumsiness he let it drop. At the moment a door opened at the back of the platform, and the leaf, caught by the draught, was blown back across the bench where Kitty and the house party were sitting, and fluttered down to a resting place on the piece of red baize whereon Lord Parham was standing, close beside his left foot. Ash saw Kitty's start of dismay, her scarlet flush, her involuntary movement. But Lord Parham had started on his peroration. 
The rustics gaped, the gentry sat expressionless, the reporters toiled after the great man. Kitty, who all the time kept her eyes fixed on the little white paper, Ash no less. Between him and Lord Parham there was first the Lord Lieutenant, a portly man, very blind and extremely deaf, then a table with a liberal peer behind it for chairman. Lord Parham had resumed his seat. The tent was shaken with cheers, and the smiling chairman had risen. Can you ask Lord Parham to hand me on that paper from the floor? said Ash in the ear of the Lord Lieutenant. It seemed to have dropped from my portfolio. The Lord Lieutenant, bending backward behind the chairman as the next speaker rose, tried to attract Lord Parham's attention. Eddie Helston was, at the same time, endeavouring to make his way forward through the crowded seats behind the Prime Minister. Meanwhile, Lord Parham had perceived the paper, raised it, and adjusted his spectacles. He thought it was a communication from the audience, a question, perhaps, that he was expected to answer. Lord Parham, cried the Lord Lieutenant again, would you? Silence, please, speak up, from the audience, who had so far failed to catch a word of what the new speaker was saying. What is the matter? You really can't get through here, said a grey-haired dowager crossly to Eddie Helston. Lord Parham looked at the paper in mystification. It contained these words. Have you been counting the eyes? I make it fifty-seven. K. And in the corner of the paper, a thumbnail sketch of himself, perorating, with a garland of capital I's round his neck. The Premier's face became brick-red, then grey again. He folded up the paper and put it in his waistcoat pocket. The meeting had broken up. For the common herd, it was to be followed by sports in the park and refreshments in big tents. For the gentry, Lady Kitty had a garden party to which royalty was coming. And as our guests streamed out of the marquee, Lord Pelham approached his hostess. I think this belongs to you, Lady Kitty. And taking it from his pocket a folded slip of paper, he offered it to her. Kitty looked at him. Her colour was high, her eyes sparkled. Nothing to do with me, she said gaily as she glanced at it, but I'll look for the owner. Sorry to give you the trouble, said Lord Parham, with a ceremonious inclination. Then, turning to Ash, he remarked that he was extremely tired, worn out, in fact, and would ask his host's leave to desert the garden party while he attended to some most important letters. Ash offered to escort him to the house. On the contrary, look after your guest, said the Premier dryly, and beckoning to the Liberal peer who had been his chairman, he engaged him in conversation, and the two presently vanished through a window opened to the terrace. Kitty had been joined meanwhile by Eddie Helston, and the two stood talking together, a flushed, excited pair. Ash overtook them. May I speak to you a moment, Kitty? Eddie Helston glanced at the fine form and stiffened bearing of his host understood that his presence counted for something in the annoyance of Ash's expression, and departed, abashed. I should like to see that paper, Kitty, if you don't mind. His frown and straightened lip brought fresh wildness into Kitty's expression. It is my property. She kept one hand behind her. I heard you just disavow that. Kitty laughed angrily. Yes, that's the worst of Lord Parham. One has to tell so many lies for his beau yo. You must give it to me, please, said Ash quietly. I ought to know where I am with Lord Parham. He is clearly bitterly offended by something, and I shall have to apologise. Kitty breathed fast. Well, don't let's quarrel before the county, she said, as she turned aside into a shrubbery walk edged by clipped yews and hidden from the big lawn. There she paused and confronted him. How did you know I wrote it? I saw you write it and throw it. He stretched out his hand. Kitty hesitated, then slowly unclosed her own and held out the small white palm on which lay the crumpled slip. Ash read it and tore it up. That game, Kitty, was hardly worth the candle. It was a perfectly harmless remark and only meant for Eddie. Anyone else than Lord Parham would have laughed. Then I might have begged his pardon. It is what you ought to do now, said Ash. A little note from you, Kitty, you could write it to perfection. Certainly not, said Kitty hastily, locking her hands behind her. You prefer to have failed in hospitality and manners, he said bitterly. Well, I'm afraid if you don't feel any disgrace in it, I do. 
Lord Parham is our guest. And Ash turned on his heel and would have left her when Kitty caught him by the arm. William! She grew very pale. Yes? You've never spoken to me like that before, William. Never. But as I told you long ago, you could stop it all if you like, in a moment. I don't know what you mean, Kitty. We mustn't stay arguing here any longer. No, but don't you remember? I told you you can always send me away. Then I shouldn't be putting spokes in your wheel. I don't deny, said Ash slowly. It might be wisest if, next spring, you stayed here, for part at least of the season, or abroad. It is certainly difficult carrying on politics under these conditions. I could, of course, come backward and forward. Kitty's brown eyes, that were fixed upon his face, wavered a little, and she grew even whiter. Very well. That would be a kind of separation, wouldn't it? There would be no need to call it by any such name. Oh, Kitty, cried Ash, why can't you behave like a reasonable woman? Separation, she repeated steadily. I know that's what your mother wants. A wave of sound reached them amid the green shadow of the yews. The cheers that heralded royalty had begun. Come, said Kitty, and she flew across the grass, reaching her place by the central tent, just as the royalties drove up. The Prime Minister sulked indoors, and Kitty, with the most engaging smiles, made his apologies. The heat, the fatigue of the speech, a crushing headache and a doctor's order. He begged their Royal Highnesses to excuse him. The Royal Highnesses were at first astonished, inclined perhaps to take offence, but the party was so agreeable and Lady Kitty so charming a hostess that the Premier's absence was soon forgotten. And, as the day cooled to a delicious evening, and the most costly bands from town discoursed a melting music, as garlanded boats appeared upon the river inviting passengers, and with the dusk fireworks began to ascend from a little hill, as the trees shone green and silver and rose colour in the Bengal lights, and amid the sweeping clouds of smoke, the wide stretches of the park and the close-packed groups of human beings appeared and vanished like the countries and creatures of a dream. The success of Lady Kitty's fate, the fame of her gaiety and her beauty, filled the air. She flashed hither and thither, in a dress embroidered with wild roses and a hat festooned with them, attended always by Eddie Helston, by various curates who cherished a hopeless attachment to her, and by a fat German grand duke who had come in the wake of the royalties. Her cleverness, her resource, her organising power were lauded to the skies. Royalty was gracious, and the Grand Duke resentfully asked an aide de camp on the way home why he had not been informed that such a pretty person awaited him. I should then have looked beforehand as well as thinking behind, said the Grand Duke, as he wrapped himself sentimentally in his military cloak cloak to meditate on Lady Kitty's brown eyes. Meanwhile, Lord Parham remained closeted in his sitting room with his secretary. Ash tried to gain admittance, but in vain. Lord Parham pleaded great fatigue and his letters, and asked for a Bradshaw. His lordship is inquired if there is a train tonight, said the little secretary, evidently much flustered. Ash protested, and indeed, as it turned out, there was no train worth the taking. Then Lord Parham sent a message that he hoped to appear at dinner. Kitty locked her door while she was dressing, and Ash, whose mind was a confusion of many feelings, anger, compunction, and that fascination which, in her brilliant moods, she exercised over him no less than over others, could get no speech with her. They met on the threshold of the child's room, she coming out, he going in but she wrenched herself away from him and would say nothing. The report of the little boy was good. He smiled at his father, and Ash felt a cooling balm in the touch of his soft hands and lips. He descended in a more philosophical mind, inclined at any rate to damn Lord Parham. What a fool the man must be! Why couldn't he have taken it with a laugh and so turned the tables on Kitty? Was there any good to be got out of apologising? I suppose he must attempt it some time that night. The precious awkward business. But relations had got to be restored somehow. Lady Tramore overtook him on the way downstairs. In the press of the afternoon they'd hardly seen each other. 
What is really wrong with Lord Parham, William? She asked him anxiously. Ash hesitated, then whispered a word or two in her ear, begging her to keep the great man in play for the evening. He was to take her in, while Kitty would fall to the bishop of the diocese. She gets on perfectly with the clergy, said Lady Tramwell, with an involuntary sigh. Then, as the sense of humour was strong in both, they laughed, but it was a chilly and perfunctory laughter. They had no sooner passed into the main hall than Kitty came running downstairs with a large packet in her hand. Mr. Darrell? At your service, said Darrell, emerging from the shadows of one of the broad corridors of the ground floor. Take it, please, said Kitty, panting a little, as she gave the packet into his hands. If I look at it any more, I might burn it. Suppose you do. No, no, said Kitty, pushing the bundle away, as he laughingly tended it. I must see what happens. Is the gap filled? She laid her finger on her lips. Her eyes danced. Then she hurried on to the drawing room. Whether it were the soothing presence of the clergy or no, certainly Kitty was no less triumphant at dinner than she had been in the afternoon. The chorus of fun and pleasure that surrounded her, while he himself sat tired and bored between Lady Edith Manley and Lady Tramwell, did but make her the fence the greater in the eyes of Lord Parham. He had so far buried it in a complete and magnificent silence. The meeting between him and his hostess before dinner had been marked by a strict conformity to all the rules. Kitty had inquired after his headache. Lord Parham expressed his regret that he had missed so brilliant a party. And Kitty, flirting her fan, invented messages from the royalties, which, as most of those present knew, the royalties had been far too well amused to think of. Then after this pass, Searle, in the presence of the crowded drawing-room, had been duly executed, Kitty retired to her bishop, and Lord Parham led forth Lady Tranmore. "'What a lovely moon!' said Lady Edith Manny to the dean. "'It makes even this house look romantic.' They were walking outside the drawing-room windows on a terrace which was indeed the only feature of the Haggerton façade which possessed some architectural interest. A low balustrade of terracotta, copied from a famous Italian villa, ran round it, broken by large terracotta pots, now filled with orange trees. Here and there, between the orange trees, were statues transported from Naples in the late 18th century by a former Lord Tranmore. There was a Ceres and a Diana, a Vestal Virgin, an Athlete and an Antinous, now brought into strange companionship under the windows of this ugly English house. Chipped and blackened as they were, and, to begin with, of a mere decorative importance, they still breathed into the English evening a note of Italy or Greece, of things lovely and immortal. The lamps in the sitting-rooms streamed out through the widely opened windows upon the terrace, checkering the marble figures, which now emerged sharply in the light and now withdrew in the gloom. But at one point they shone plainly upon an empty pedestal, before which the dean and his companion paused. The dean looked at the inscription. What a pity! This once held a statue of Hebe holding a torch. It was struck by lightning fifty years ago. Lady Kitty might stand for her tonight, said the Edith Manley. For Kitty, the capricious, had appeared at dinner in a quasi-Greek dress, white, soft and flowing, without an ornament. The dean acquiesced, but rather sadly. I wish she had the bloom of Hebe. My dear Lady Edith, our hostess looks ill. Does she? I can't tell. I admire her so said the woman beside him, upon whose charming eyes some fairy had breathed kindness and optimism from her cradle. Off! cried Kitty, as she sprang across the sill of the window behind them. They're all gone. The bishop wishes me to become a vice-president of the Women's Diocesan Association, and I promised three curates to open bazaars. Ah, mon dieu! She raised her white arms with a wild gesture, and then beckoned to Eddie Helson, who was close beside her. Shall we try our dance? The young men of the house, a group of young guardsmen and diplomats, gathered round, laughing and clapping. Kitty's dancing had become famous during the winter as one of her many extravagances. She no longer recited. Literature bored her. Motion was the only poetry. So she had been carefully instructed by a danseuse from the opera, and in many points, so the enthusiasts declared, had bettered her instructions. She was now in love with a tempestuous Spanish dance, taught her by a gypsy senorita who had been one of the sensations of the London season. It required a partner, 
and she'd been practising it with young Helston for several mornings past in the empty ballroom. Helston had spread its praises abroad, and all Haggart desired to see it. There, said Kitty, pointing her partner to a particular spot on the terrace. I think that will do. Where are the castanets, I wonder? Kitty, said a voice behind her. Ash emerged from the drawing room. Kitty, please. It is nearly midnight. Everybody is tired, and you yourself must be worn out. Say good night and let us all go to bed. She turned. William's voice was low but peremptory. She shook back her hair from her temples and neck with the gesture he had learned to dread. Nobody's tired and nobody wants to go to bed. Please stand out of the way, William. I want plenty of room for my steps. And she began pirouetting as though to try the capacities of the space, humming to herself. Helston, this must be, please, for another night, said Ash resolutely to the young man's ear. Lady Kitty is much too tired. Then to Lady Edith at the tea. Lady Edith, it would be very kind of you to persuade my wife to go to bed. She never knows when she is done. Lady Edith warmly acquiesced, and, hurrying up to Kitty, she tried to persuade her in soft, caressing phrases. I stand on my rights, said the dean, following her. If my hostess is used up tonight, there'll be no hostess for me tomorrow. Kitty looked at them all, silent, her head bending forward, a curious méchant look in the eyes that shone beneath the slightly frowning brows. Meanwhile, by her previous order, a footman had brought out two silver lamps and placed them on a small table a little way behind her. Whether it was from some instinctive sense of the beauty of the small figure, in the slender floating dress, under the deep blue of the night sky, and amid the romantic shadows and lights of the terrace, or from some divination of things significant and hidden, it would be hard to say. But the group of spectators had fallen back a little from Kitty, so that she stood alone, a picture lit from the left by the lamps just brought in. The dean looked at her, troubled by her wild aspect and the evident conflict between her and Ash. Then an idea flashed into his mind, filled always like the effort of an innocent child with the images of poetry and romance. One moment, he said, raising his hand. Lady Kitty, you spoil us. After amusing us all day, now you would dance for us all night. But your guests won't let you. We love you too well, and we want a bit of you left for tomorrow. Never mind. You offered us a dance. You bring us a vision. And a poem. Friends. He turned to those crowding round him, his white hair glistening in the lamplight, his delicate face so old and yet so eager, a smile on his kind lips, and all the details of his dean's dress, apron and knee breeches, slender legs and silver buckles, thrown out in sharp relief upon the dark. Friends, you see this pedestal. Once Hebe, the cup-bearer of the gods, stood there. Then ungrateful Zeus smote her, and she fell. But the hours and the graces bore her safe away into a golden land, and now they bring her back again. Behold her, Hebe, reborn. He bowed his courtly hand upon his breast, and a wave of laughter and applause ran through the young group round him, as their eyes turned from the speaker to the exquisite figure of Kitty. Lady Edith smiled kindly, clapping her soft hands. Mrs Winston, the dean's wife, had eyes only for the dean. In the background, Lady Trammell watched every phase of Kitty's looks, and Lord Grosfell walked back into the dining room, growling unutterable things to Darrell as he passed. Kitty raised her head to reply, but the dean checked her. Advancing a step or two, he saluted her again, profoundly, Dear Lady Kitty, dear bringer of light and ambrosia, rest and good night. Your guests thank you by me with all their hearts. You have been the life of their day, the spirit of their mirth. Good night to Hebe, and three cheers for Lady Kitty. Lady Helston led them, and they rang against the old house. Kitty, with a fluttering smile, kissed her hand for thanks, and the dean saw her look round, dart a swift glance at Ash. He stood against the window frame, in shadow, motionless, his arms folded. And suddenly Kitty sprang forward. Give me that lamp, she said to the young footman behind her. And in a second she leaped upon the low wall of the terrace and on the vacant pedestal. The lad to whom she had spoken lost his head and obeyed her. He raised the lamp. She stooped and took it. Ash, who was now standing in the open window with his back to the terrace, turned round, saw and rushed forward. Kitty, put it down. Lady Kitty, 
cried the dean in dismay, when all behind him held their breath. Stand back, said Kitty, or I shall drop it. She held up the lamp straight and steady. Ash paused, in an agony of doubt what to do, his whole soul concentrated on the slender arm and on the brightly burning lamp. If you make me speeches, said Kitty, I must reply, mustn't I? Keep back, William, I'm all right. He be thanks you, please, mille fois. She herself hasn't been happy, and she's afraid she hasn't been good. N'importe. It's all done and finished. The play's over, and the lights go out. She waved the lamp above her head. Kitty, for God's sake, cried Ash, rushing to her. He's mad, said Lord Parham, standing at the back. I always knew it. The other spectators passed through a second of anguish. The bright figure on the pedestal wavered. One moment, and it seemed as though the lamp must descend crashing upon the head and neck of the white dress beneath it. The next, it had fallen from Kitty's hand, fallen away from her, wide and safe into the depths of the garden below. A flash of wild light rose from the burning oil and from the dry shrubs amid which it fell. Kitty, meanwhile, swayed and dropped, heavily, unconscious, into William Ashe's arms. Kitty barely recovered life and sense during the night that followed. And while she was still unconscious, her boy passed away. The poor babe, all ignorant of the straits in which his mother lay, was seized with convulsions in the dawn, and gave up his frail life gathered to his father's breast. Some ten weeks later, towards the end of October, society knew that the Home Secretary and Lady Kitty had started for Italy, bound first of all for Venice. It was said that Lady Kitty was a wreck, and that it was doubtful whether she would ever recover the sudden and tragic death of her only child. End of Part 3, Chapter 16Part 4 of The Marriage of William Ash by Mary Augusta Ward. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Part 4. Storm. Myself, arch traitor to myself, my hollowest friend and my deadliest foe, my clog, whatever road I go. Chapter 17. Among the numerous daubs with which Tintoret, to his everlasting shame, has covered this church, Good heavens, what does the man mean? Or is he talking of another church? said Ash, raising his head and looking in bewilderment, first at the magnificent Tintoret in front of him, and then at the lines he had just been reading. William, cried Kitty, do put that fool down and come here. One sees it splendidly. She was standing in one of the choir stalls of San Giorgio Maggiore, somewhat raised above the point where Ash had been studying his German handbook. My dear, if this man doesn't know, who does? cried Ash, flourishing his volume in front of him as he obeyed her. Dona Royem des Aveugles, said Kitty contemptuously, as if any German could even begin to understand Tintoret. But, but don't talk. And, clasping both hands round Ash's arm, she stood leaning heavily upon him, her whole soul gazing from the eyes she turned upon the picture, her lips quivering, as though from some physical weakness, she could only just hold back the tears with which indeed the face was charged. She and Ash were looking at that last supper of Tintoret's which hangs in the choir of San Giorgio Maggiore at Venice. It is a picture dear to all lovers of Tintoret, breathing in every line and group the passionate and mystical fancy of the master. The scene passes, it will be remembered, in what seems to be the spacious guest chamber of an inn. The Lord and his disciples are gathered round the last sacred meal of the Old Covenant, the first of the New. On the left, a long table stretches from the spectator into the depths of the picture. The disciples are ranged along one side of it, and on the other sits Judas, solitary and accursed. The young Christ has risen. He holds the bread in his lifted hands, and is about to give it to the beloved disciple, while Peter beyond, rising from his seat in his eagerness, presses forward to claim his own part in the Lord's body. The action of the Christ has in it a very ecstasy of giving. The bending form, indeed, is love itself yearning and triumphant. This is further expressed in the light which streams from the head of the Lord, 
playing upon the long lines of faces, illuminating the vehement gesture of Peter, the adoring and radiant silence of St John, and striking even to the farthest corners of the room, upon a woman, a child, a playing dog. Meanwhile, from the hanging lamps above the supper party, there glows another and more earthly light, mingled with fumes of smoke which darken the upper air. But such is the power of the divine figure that from its very darkness spreads adoration. The smoke wreaths change under the gazer's eye into hovering angels who float round to the head of the Saviour and look down with awe upon the first Eucharist, while the lamplight, interpenetrated by the glory which issues from the Lord, searches every face and fold and surface, displays the figures of the serving men and women in the background, shines on the household stuff, the vases and plates, the black and white of the marble floor, the beams of the old Venetian ceiling. Everywhere the double ray, the twofold magic. Steeped in these majesties of light, the immortal scene lives upon the quiet wall. Year after year, the slender, thought-worn Christ raises his hands of blessing, the disciples strain towards him, the angels issue from the darkness. The friendly domestic life, happy, natural, unconscious, frames the divine mystery. And among those who come to look, there are, from time to time, men and women who draw from it that restlessness of vague emotion which Kitty felt as she hung now gazing on Ash's arm. For there is in it an appeal which torments them, like the winding of a mystic horn on purple heights by some approaching and unseen messenger. Ineffable beauty offering itself, and in the human soul the eternal human discord. What else makes the poignancy of art, the passion of poetry? That's enough, said Kitty at last, turning abruptly away. You like it? said Ash, softly detaining her, while he pressed the little hand upon his arm. His heart was filled with a great pity for his wife in these days. Oh, I don't know, was Kitty's impatient reply. It haunts me. There's still another to see in a chapel, the sacristan's making signs to us. Is there? Ash stifled a yawn. He asked Margaret French, who had come up with them, whether Kitty had not had quite enough sightseeing. He himself must go to the piazza and get the news before dinner. As an English cabinet minister, he had been admitted to the best club of the Venice residence. Telegrams were to be seen there, and there was anxious news from the Balkans. Kitty merely insisted that she could not and would not go without her remaining Tintoret, and the others yielded to her at once, with that indulgent tenderness one shows to, to the wilfulness of a sick child. She and Margaret followed the sacristan. Ash lingered behind in a passage of the church, surreptitiously reading an Italian newspaper. He had the ordinary cultivated pleasure in pictures, but this ardour which Kitty was throwing into her pursuit of Tintoret, the Wagner of painting, left him cold. He did not attempt to keep up with her. Two ladies were already in the cloister chapel with a gentleman. As Kitty and her friend entered, these persons had just finished their inspection of the damaged but most beautiful Pieta which hangs over the altar, and their faces were towards the entrance. Maman! cried Kitty in amazement. The lady addressed started, put up a gold-rimmed eyeglass, exclaimed, and hurried forward. Kitty and she embraced amid a torrent of laughter and interjections from the elder lady, and then Kitty, whose pale cheeks had put on scarlet, turned to Margaret French. Margaret! My mother! Madame d'Estre! Miss French, who found herself greeted with effusion by the strange lady, saw before her a woman of fifty, marvellously preserved. Madame d'Estre had grown stout, so much time had claimed, but the elegant grey dress with its floating chiffon and lace skilfully concealed the fact, and for the rest, complexion, eyes, lips were still defiant of the years. If it were art that had achieved it, nature still took the credit. It was so finely done, the spectator could only lend himself and admire. Under the pretty hat of grey tulle, whereof the strings were tied bonnet fashion under the plump chin, there looked out, indeed, a face gay, happy, unconcerned, proof, one might have thought, of an innocent past and a good conscience. Kitty, who had drawn back a little, eyed her mother oddly. I thought you were in Paris. Your letter said you wouldn't be able to move for weeks. Ma chère, un miracle, cried Madame d'Estre, 
blushing, however, under her thin white veil. When I wrote to you, I was at death's door, wasn't I? She appealed to her companion without waiting for an answer. Then someone told me of a new doctor, and in ten days, more voici. They insisted on my going away. This dear woman, Donna Laura Vercelli, my daughter, Lady Kitty Ash, knew of an apartment here belonging to some relations of hers. And here we are, charmingly installés, and really nothing to pay, Madame Destres whispered, smiling in Kitty's ear. Nothing compared to the hotels. I'm economising splendidly. Laura looks after every sou. Ah, my dear William. For Ash, puzzled by the voices within, had entered the chapel and stood in his turn open-mouthed. Why, we thought you were an invalid. For some three weeks before, a letter had reached him at Haggard's, so full of melancholy details as to Madame d'Astre's health and circumstances that even Kitty had been moved. Money had been sent, inquiries had been made by telegraph, and, but for a hasty message of a more cheerful character, received just before they started, the Ashes, instead of journeying by Brussels and Cologne, would have gone by Paris, that Kitty might see her mother. They had intended to stop there on their way back. Ash was not minded that Kitty should see more of Madame d'Estre than necessity demanded. But on this occasion he would have felt it positively brutal to make difficulties. And now here was this moribund lady, this forsaken of gods and men, disporting herself at Venice, evidently in the pink of health, and attired in the freshest of Paris toilette. As he coldly shook hands, Ash registered an inner vow that Madame d'Estre's letters henceforward should receive the attention they deserved. And beside her was her somewhat mysterious friend of London days, the Colonel Warrington, who had been so familiar a figure in the gatherings of St. James's Place, grown much older, almost white-haired, and as gentlemanly as ever. Who was the lady? Ash was introduced, was aware of a somewhat dark and Jewish cast of face, noticed some fine jewels, and could only suppose that his mother-in-law had picked up someone to finance her, and provide her with creature comforts in return for the social talents that Madame Destre still possessed in some abundance. He had more than once noticed her skill in similar devices, but indeed they were indispensable, for while he allowed Madame Destre one thousand a year, she was, it seemed, firmly determined to spend a minimum of three. He and Warrington looked at each other with curiosity. The bronzed face and honest eyes of the soldier betrayed nothing. Are you going to marry her at last? thought Ash. Poor devil! Meanwhile, Madame Destres chattered away as though nothing could be more natural than their meeting, or more perfect than the relations between herself and her daughter and son-in-law. As they all strolled down the church, she looked keenly at Kitty. My dear child, how ill you look! And your mourning! Ah, yes, of course, she bit her lip. I remember the poor, poor boy. Thank you, said Kitty hastily. I got your letter. Thank you very much. Where are you staying? We've got rooms on the Grand Canal. Oh, but Kitty, cried Madame Destre, I was so sorry for you. Were you? said Kitty under her breath. Then please never speak of him to me again. Startled and offended, Madame Destre looked at her daughter. But what she saw disarmed her. For once, even she felt something like a pang of a mother. You're dreadfully thin, Kitty. Kitty frowned with annoyance. It's not my fault, she said pettishly. I live on cream, and it's no good. Of course, I know I'm an object and a scarecrow, but I'd rather people didn't tell me. What a nonsense, cher enfant. You're much prettier than you ever were. A wild and fugitive radiance swept across the face beside her. Am I? said Kitty, smiling. That's all right. If I died, it wouldn't matter, of course, but... Died? What do you mean, Kitty? said Madame Destre in bewilderment. When William wrote to me, I thought he meant you had overtired yourself. Oh, well, the doctor said it was touch and go, said Kitty indifferently. But of course it wasn't. I'm much too tough. And then they fussed about one's heart, and that's all nonsense, too. I couldn't die if I tried. But Madame Destre pondered. The bright, intermittent colour the emaciation, the hollowness of the eyes. The effect, so far, was to add to Kitty's natural distinction, to give rather a touch of pathos to a face which even in its wildest mirth had in it something alien and remote. But she too reflected that a little more, a very little more, and, in a night, the face would have dropped its beauty as a rose its petals. 
the group stood talking a while on the steps outside the church. Kitty and her mother exchanged addresses. Donna Laura opened her mouth once or twice and produced a few contorted smiles for Kitty's benefit, while Colonel Warrington tipped the sacristan, found the gondolier, and studied the guidebook. As Madame Destre stepped into her gondola, assisted by him, she tapped him on the arm. Are you coming, Markham? The low voice was pitched in a very intimate note. Kitty turned with a start. A cassa, said Madame Destre, and she and her friend made for one of the canals of Piazza de Zateri, while Colonel Warrington went off for a walk along the Giudeccia. Kitty and Ash bade their gondoliers take them to the Piazzetta, and presently they were gliding across waters of flame and silver, where the right front and red campanile of San Giorgio, now blazing under the sunset, mirrored themselves in the dragoon. The autumn evening was fresh and gay. A light breeze was on the water, lights that only Venice knows shone on the tawny sails of fishing boats making for the Lido, on the white sides of an English yacht, on the burnished prows of the gondolas, on the warm reddish white of the ducal palace. The air, blowing from the Adriatic, breathed into their faces the strength of the sea. And in the far distance, above that line of buildings where lies the heart of Venice, the high ghosts of the Friulian Alps glimmered amid the sweeping regiments and purple shadows of the land-hurrying clouds. "'This does you good, darling,' said Ash, stooping down to look into his wife's face as she nestled beside him on the soft cushions of the gondola. Kitty gave him a slight smile then said with a furrowed brow, Who could ever have thought we should find Mummel here? Don't have her on your mind, said Ash with some sharpness. I can't have anything worrying you. She slipped her hand into his. Is that man going to marry her, at last? She called him Markham. That's new. Looks rather like it, said Ash. Then he'll have to look after the debts. They began to piece together what they knew of Colonel Warrington and his relation to Madame Destre. It was not much, but Ash believed that originally Warrington had not been in love with her at all. There had been a love affair between her and Warrington's younger brother, a smart artillery officer, when she was the widowed Lady Blackwater. She had behaved with more heart and scruple than she had generally been known to do in these matters, and the young officer, a daughter, hoped indeed to marry her. But he was called on, in Paris, to fight a duel on her account, and was killed. Before fighting, he commended Lady Blackwater to the care of his much older brother, also a soldier, between whom and himself there existed a rare and passionate devotion. And ever since the poor lad's death, Markham Warrington had been the friend and quasi-guardian of the lady, through her second marriage, through the chequered years of her existence in London, and now through the later years of her residence on the continents, a residence forced upon her by her agreement with the Tranmores. Again and again he had saved her from bankruptcy, or from some worse scandal which would have wrecked the last remnants of her fame. But all the time he was himself bound by strong ties of gratitude and affection to an elder sister who had brought him up, with whom he lived in Scotland during half the year. And this stout Puritan lady detested the very name of Madame Destre. But she's dead, said Ash. I remember noticing her death in the time some three months ago. That, of course, explains it. He's Now he's free to marry. And so Mamma will settle down and be happy ever afterwards, said Kitty, with a sarcastic lifting of the brow. Why should anybody be good? The bitterness of her look struck Ash disagreeably. That any child should speak so of a mother was a tragic and sinister thing. But he was well aware of the causes. Were you very unhappy when you were a child, Kitty? He pressed the hand he held. No, said Kitty shortly. I'm too like Maman. I suppose really at bottom I liked all the debts and the excitement and the shady people. <laughs> that wasn't the impression you gave me in the first days of our acquaintance, said Ash, laughing. Oh, then I was grown up and there were drawbacks. But I'm made of the same stuff as Maman, she said obstinately except that I can't tell so many fibs. That's really why we didn't get on. Her brown eyes held him with that strange, unspoken defiance it seemed so often beyond her power to hide. It was like the fluttering of some caged thing, hungering for it knows not what. Then, 
as they scanned the patient good temper of his face, they melted, and her little fingers squeezed his, while Margaret French kept her eyes fixed on the two columns of the piazzetta. How strange to find her here, said Kitty, under her breath. Now, if it had been Alice, my sister Alice. William nodded. It had been known to them for some time that Lady Alice Wensleydale, to whom Italy had become a second country, had settled in a villa near Treviso, where she occupied herself with a lace school for women and girls. The mention of her sister threw Kitty into what seemed to be a disagreeable reverie. A flush brought by the sea wind faded. Ash looked at her with anxiety. You've done too much, Kitty, as usual. His voice was almost angry. She shrugged her shoulders. What does it matter? You know very well it would be much better for you if... If what? If I followed Harry. The words were just breathed, and her eyes shrank from meeting his. Ash, on the other hand, turned and looked at her steadily. Are you quite determined I shan't get any joy out of my holiday? She shook her head uncertainly. Then almost immediately she began to chatter to Margaret French about the sights of the lagoon with her natural trenchancy and fun. But her hand, hidden under the folds of her black cloak, still clung to William's. It is her illness, he said to himself, and the loss of the child. And at the remembrance of his little son, a wave of sore yearning filled his own heart. Deep under the occupations and interests of the mind lay this passionate regret, and at any moment of pause or silence its buried life arose and seized him. But he was a busy politician, absorbed even in these days of holiday by the questions and problems of the hour. And Kitty was a delicate woman, with no defence against the torture of grief. He thought of those first days after the child's death, when, in spite of the urgency of the doctors, it had been impossible to keep the news from Kitty. Of the ghastly effect of it upon nerves and brain, already imperiled by causes only half intelligible. Of those sudden flights from her nurses, when the days of convalescence began, to the child's room, and later to his grave. There was stinging pain in these recollections. Nor was he, in truth, much reassured by his wife's more recent state. It was impossible, indeed, that she should give it the same constant thought as a woman might, or a man of another and more emotional type. At this moment, perhaps, he had literally no time for the subtleties of introspective feeling, even had his temperament inclined him to them, which was, in truth, not the case. He knew that Kitty had suddenly and resolutely ceased to talk about the boy, had thrown herself with the old energy into new pursuits, and, since she came to Venice in particular, had shown a feverish desire to fill every hour with movement and sightseeing. But was she, in truth, much better, in body or soul? Poor child. The doctors had explained her illness as nervous collapse, pointing back to a long preceding period of overstrain and excitement. There had been suspicions of tubercular mischief, but no precise test was then at command, and, as Kitty had improved with rest and feeding, the idea had been abandoned. But Ash was still haunted by it, though quite ready, being a natural optimist, to escape from it and all other incurable anxieties as soon as Kitty herself should give the signal. As to the moral difficulties and worries in those months at Haggard, Ash remembered them as little as might be, Kitty's illness indeed has shown itself in more directions than one as an amending and appeasing fact. Even Lord Parham would be moved to compassion and kindness by the immediate result of that horrible scene on the terrace. His leave taken from Ash on the morning afterwards had been almost cordial, almost intimate. And as to Lady Trammell, whenever she had been able to leave her paralysed husband, she had been with Kitty, nursing her with affectionate wisdom night and day while on the other members of the Haggard party, the sheer pity of Kitty's condition had worked with surprising force. Lord Grosfield had actually made his wife offer Grosfield Park for Kitty's convalescence. Kitty got her first laugh out of the proposal. The dean had journeyed several times from his distant cathedral town to see and sit with Kitty. Eddie Helston's flowers had been almost a nuisance. Mrs Alcott had shown herself quite soft and human. 
The effect, indeed, of this general sympathy on Lord Parham's relations to the chief members of Cabinet had been but small and passing. Ash disliked and distrusted him more than ever, and whatever might have happened to the Premier's resentment of a particular offence, there could be no doubt that a visit from which Ash had hoped much had ended in complete failure. But Parham was disposed to cross his powerful henchman where he could, and that intrigue was busy in the Cabinet itself against the reforming party of which Ash was the head. Ash, indeed, felt his own official position, outwardly so strong, by no means secure. But the game of politics was none the less exhilarating for that. As to Kitty's relation to himself, and life's most intimate and tender things, in these days did he probe his own consciousness much concerning them? Probably not. Was he aware that when all was said and done, in spite of her misdoings, in spite of his passion of anxiety during her illness, in spite of the pity and affection of his daily attitude, Kitty occupied, in truth, much less of his mind than she had ever yet occupied? That a certain magic, primal, incommunicable, had ceased to clothe her image in his thoughts? Again, probably not. For these slow changes in a man's inmost personality are like the ebb and flow of summer tides of estuary sands. Silent, the main creeps in or out. And while we dream, the great basin fills, and the fishing boats come in, all the gentle pitiless waters draw back into the bosom of ocean, and the seabirds run over the wide, untenanted flats. They landed at the Piazzetta as the lamps were being lit. A soft October darkness was falling fast, and on the ledges of some marks on the Ducal Palace the pigeons had begun to roost. An animated crowd was walking up and down in the piazza where a band was playing, and on the golden horses of St Mark's there shone a pale and mystical light, the last reflection from the western sky. Under the colonnades the jewellers and glass shops blazed and sparkled, and the warm sea wind fluttered the Italian flags on the great flagstaffs that but so recently had borne the Austrian eagle. Ash walked with his head thrown back, thinking absently, in this centre of Venice, of English politics, and of a phrase of Metternich's he had come across in a volume of memoirs he had been lately reading on the journey. Le jour qui cote n'a qu'une valeur pour moi, excepté comme la veille du lendemain. C'est toujours avec le lendemain que mon esprit lutte. The phrase pleased him particularly. He too was resting with the morrow, though in another sense than Metternich's. His mind was alive with projects, an exultant consciousness both of capacity and opportunity possessed him. "'Why, you've passed the club, William,' said Kitty. Asher woke with a start, smiled at her, and with a wave of the hand disappeared in a stairway to the right. Margaret French lingered in a bead shop to make some purchases. Kitty walked home alone, and Margaret, whose watchful affection never failed, knew that she preferred it and let her go her way. The Ashes had rooms on the first bend of the Grand Canal, looking south. To reach them by land from the piazza, Kitty had to pass through a series of narrow streets, or galle, broken by campos, or small squares, in which stood churches. As she passed one of these churches, she was attracted by the sound of gay music, and by the crowd about the entrance. Pushing aside the leathern curtain over the door, she found herself in a great rococo nave which blazed with lights and decorations. Lines of huge wax candles were fixed in temporary holders along the floor. The pillars were swathed in rose-coloured damask, and the choir was ablaze with flowers, and even more brilliantly lit, if possible, than the rest of the church. Kitty's Catholic training told her that an exposition of the Blessed Sacrament was going on. Mechanically she dipped her fingers into the holy water, she made her genuflection to the altar, and knelt down in one of the back rows. How rich and sparkling it was, the lights, the bright colours, the dancing music. Dolce Sacramento, Santo Sacramento. These words of an Italian hymn or litany recurred again and again with endless iteration. Kitty's sensuous, excitable nature was stirred with delight. Then suddenly she remembered her child, and the little face she'd seen for the last time in the coffin. She began to cry softly, hiding her face in her black veil. 
an unbearable longing possessed her. I shall never have another child, she thought. That's all over. Then her thoughts wandered back to the party at Haggard, to the scene on the terrace, and to that rush of excitement which had mastered her. She scarcely knew how or why. She could still hear the dean's voice, see the lamp wavering above her head. What possessed me? I didn't care a straw whether the lamp set me on fire, whether I lived or died. I wanted to die. Was it because of that short conversation with William in the afternoon? Because of the calmness with which she had taken that word, separation, which she had thrown at him merely as a child boasts and threatens, never expecting for one moment to be taken at its word? She had proposed it to him before, after the night at Hamel Weir. She had been serious then. It had been an impulse of remorse, and he had laughed at her. But at Haggard it had been an impulse of temper, and he had taken it seriously. How the wound had rankled all the afternoon while she was chattering to the royalties. And as she jumped on the pedestal and saw his face of horror, there was a typical womanish triumph that she had made him feel, would make him feel yet more. How good, how tender he'd be to her in this. And yet, yet, he cares for politics, for his plans, not for me. He will never trust me again, as he did once. He'll never ask me to help him. He'll find ways not to. Though he'll be very sweet to me all the time. And the thought of her nullity with him in the future, her insignificance in his life, tortured her. Why had she treated Lord Parham so? I can be a lady when I choose, she said mockingly to herself. I wasn't even a lady. Then suddenly there flashed on her memory a little picture of Lord Parham, standing spectacled and bewildered, peering into her slip of paper. She bent her head on her hands and laughed, a stifled hysterical laugh which scandalised the woman kneeling beside her. But the laugh was soon quenched again in restless pain. William's affection had been her only refuge in those weeks of moral and physical misery she had just passed through. But it's only because he's so terribly sorry for me. It's all quite different, and I can't ever make him love me again in the old way. It wasn't my fault. It's something born in me that catches me by the throat. And she had the actual physical sense of someone strangling by a possessing force. Dolce Sacramento, Santo Sacramento. The music swayed and echoed through the church. Kitty uncovered her eyes and felt a sudden exhilaration in the blaze of light. It reminded her of the bending Christ in the picture of San Giorgio. Awe and beauty flowed in upon her, in spite of the poor music of the tawdry church. What if she tried religion, recalled what she'd been taught in the convent, gave herself up to a director? She shivered. How would she ever maintain her faith against William? William, who knew so much more than she. Then, into the emptiness of her heart, there stole the inevitable temptations of memory. Where was Geoffrey? She knew well that he was a violent and selfish man, but he understood much in her that William would never understand. With a morbid eagerness, she recalled the play of feeling between them, before that mad evening at Hamel Weir. What perpetual excitement, no time to think or regret. During her weeks of illness, she had lost all count of his movements. Had he been still writing during the summer for the newspaper which had sent him out? Had there not been rumours of his being wounded or attacked by fever? Her memory, still vague and weak, struggled painfully with memories it could not recapture. The Italian paper of that morning, she had spelled it out for herself at breakfast, had spoken of a defeat of the insurrectionary forces and of their withdrawal into the highlands of Bosnia. There would be a lull in the fighting. Would he come home? And all this time had he been the mere spectator and reporter, or fighting himself? Her passes leaped as she thought of him leading downtrodden peasants against the turf. But she knew nothing. Surely during the last few months he had purposely made a mystery of his doings and his whereabouts. The only sign of him which seemed to have reached England had been that volume of poems with those hateful lines. Her lips quivered. She was like a weak child, 
unable to bear the thought of anything hostile and unkind. If he'd already turned homeward, perhaps he would come through Venice. Anyway, he was not far off. The day before, she and Margaret had made their first visit to the Lido, and as Kitty stood fronting the Adriatic waves, she had dreamed that somewhere beyond the farthest coast were those Bosnian mountains in which Geoffrey had passed the winter. Then she started at her own thoughts, rose, loathing herself, drew down her veil and moved towards the door. As she reached the leathern curtain which hung over the doorway, a lady in front who was passing through held the curtain aside that Kitty might follow. Kitty stepped into the street and looked up to say a mechanical, Thank you. But the word died on her lips. She gave a stifled cry which was echoed by the woman before her. Both stood motionless, staring at each other. Kitty recovered herself first. It's not my fault that we've met, she said, panting a little. Don't look at me so so unkindly. I know you don't want to see me. Why, why should we speak at all? I'm going away. She turned with a gesture of farewell. Alice Wensleydale laid a detaining hand on Kitty's arm. No, stay a moment. You're in black. You look ill. Kitty turned toward her. They had moved on instinctively into the shelter of one of the narrow streets. My boy died two months ago, she said, holding herself proudly aloof. Lady Alice started. I hadn't heard. I'm very sorry for you. How old was he? Three years old. Poor baby. The words were very low and soft. My boy was fourteen. But you have other children? No, and I don't want them. They might die too. Lady Alice paused. She still held her half-sister by the arm, towering above her. She was quite as thin as Kitty, but much taller and more largely built. And beside the elaborate elegance of Kitty's mourning, Alice's black veil and dress had a severe, conventional air. They were almost the dress of a religious. How are you? she said gently. I often think of you. Are you happy in your marriage? Kitty laughed. We're such a happy lot, aren't we? We understand it so well. Oh, don't trouble about me. You know you said you couldn't have anything to do with me. Are you staying in Venice? I came in from Trefiso for a day or two to see a friend. You'd better not stay, said Kitty hastily. Maman is here, at least if you don't want to run across her. Lady Alice let go her hold. I shall go home tomorrow morning. They moved on a few steps in silence, then Alice paused. Kitty's delicate face and cloud of hair made a pale, luminous spot in the darkness of the cabinet. Alice looked at her with emotion. I want to say something to you. Yes? If you are ever in trouble, if you ever want for me, send for me. Address Treviso, and it will always find me. Kitty made no reply. They had reached a bridge over a side canal, and she stopped, leaning on the parapet. Did you hear what I said? asked her companion. Yes, I'll remember. I suppose you think it is your duty. What do you do with yourself? I have two orphan children I bring up, and there is my lace school. It doesn't get on much, but it occupies me. Are you a Catholic? Yes. Wish I was, said Kitty. She hung over the marble balustrade in silence, looking at the crescent moon that was just peering over the eastern palaces of the canal. My husband is in politics, you know. He's Home Secretary. Yes, I heard. Do you help him? No, just the other thing. Kitty lifted up a pebble and let it drop into the water. I don't know what you mean by that, said Alice Wensleydale coldly. If you don't help him, you'll be sorry. When it's too late to be sorry. Oh, I know, said Kitty, and she moved restlessly. I must go in. Good night. She held out her hand. Lady Alice took it. Good night, and remember. I shan't want anybody, said Kitty. Adieu. She waved her hand, and Alice Wensleydale, whose way lay towards the piazza, saw her disappear, a small, tripping shadow between the high, close-piled houses. Kitty was in so much excitement after this conversation that when she reached the Campo San Maurizio, 
where she should have turned abruptly to the left, she wandered a while up and down the campo, looking at the gondoliers of the traghetto between it and the Accademia, at the church of San Maurizio, at the rising moon, and the bright lights in some of the shop windows of the small streets to the north. The sea wind was still warm and gusty, and the waves in the Grand Canal beat against the marble feet of its palaces. At last she found her way through narrow passages, past hidden and historic buildings, to the back of the palace on the Grand Canal in which their rooms were. A door in a small court opened to her ring. She found herself on a dark ground floor, empty except for the felzi or black top of a gondola, of which the farther doors opened on the canal. A cheerful Italian servant brought lamps, and on the marble stairs was her maid waiting for her. In a few minutes she was on her sofa by a bright wood fire, while Blanche hovered round her with many small attentions. "'Have you seen your letters, my lady?' said Blanche, handing her a pile. Upon a parcel lying uppermost, Kitty pounced at once with avidity. She tore it open, pausing once with scarlet cheeks to look round her at the door, as though she was afraid of being seen. A book, fresh and new, emerged. Politics and the Country Houses. So ran the title on the back. Kitty looked at it, frowning. He might have found a better name. Then she opened it, looked at a page here and a page there, laughed, shivered, and at last bethought her to read the note from the publisher which accompanied it. Much pleasure, the first printed copy, three more to follow, sure to make a sensation. Hateful wretch, if your ladyship will let us know how many presentation copies. Goodness, not one. Oh, well, Madeline, perhaps. And, of course, Mr. Darrell. She opened a little dispatch box in which she kept her letters and slipped the book in. I won't show it to William tonight. Not, not till next week. The book was to be out on the 20th, a week ahead, three months from the day when she'd given the manuscript into Darrell's hands. She'd been spared all the trouble of correcting proofs, which had been done for her by the publisher's reader, on the plea of her illness. She'd received, and destroyed, various letters from him, almost without reading them, during a short absence of Williams in the north. Suddenly a start of terror ran through her. No, no, she said, resting with herself. He'll scold me, perhaps. At first, of course, I know he'll do that, and, and then I'll make him laugh. He, he, he can't, he can't help laughing. I know it'll amuse him. He'll see how I meant it, too, and nobody need ever find out. She heard his step outside, hastily locked her dispatch box, threw a shawl over it, and lay back languidly on her pillows, awaiting him. End of part four, chapter seventeen.